to the Michigan Theater for the annual Copernicus Lecture. My name is Geneviève Zubrzycki. I'm Associate Professor of Sociology and Director of Polish Studies here at the University of Michigan. And today I have the honor and the great pleasure to introduce our distinguished guest, acclaimed film director Agnieszka Holland. Before I do so, however, I first would like to express gratitude to the institutions and the departments that I have made uh, that have worked together to make possible Ms. Holland's uh, visit to Ann Arbor, um, and that have built around that visit an impressive program. So in addition to today's lecture and screening of In Darkness at 7 p.m., the program includes um, a mini course on Holocaust memory through the, the work of, of uh, Agnieszka Holland, and also the screening in the past six weeks of seven different films from Ms. Holland. So I'd like to give special thanks to the Copernicus Endowment for Polish Studies, Rackham and the International Institute, the U of M Screen Arts and Culture, the Polish Cultural Fund of Ann Arbor, the Michigan Theater, and especially also to Marisha Ostefin and her staff at Kreese and the Weiser Center for coordinating all aspects of these special events. Now it is impossible to properly introduce Agnieszka Holland in two minutes, but that's what I will do. Agnieszka Holland was born in Warsaw in 1948 in a city barely recovering from the war's destruction. And in the mid-1960s, still in her teens, she left Poland to study at Prague's renowned FAMU school, the film and television faculty of the Academy of the Performing Arts. And there she not only learned her craft, but she also witnessed and participated in the Prague Spring, for which she was imprisoned. She returned to Poland after graduating in 1971, and there she began, began her film career. She's worked closely with Krzysztof Zanussi and Andrzej Wajda, and then she directed her own feature films. Political events and life choices have later brought her to direct films and television miniseries throughout Europe and North America, creating an artistic corpus that is truly transnational in the broadest sense of the term. Her most recent project, which she has just finished shooting in the Czech Republic, is an HBO miniseries on the aftermath of the Prague Spring. Ms. Holland's work has been recognized over the years by prestigious distinctions and awards from, among others, the Cannes Film Festival, the Golden Globes, the New York Film Circle, the National Board of Review, the Emmys, and most recently uh, by the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, better known uh, as the Oscars, which nominated In Darkness for Best Foreign Film. Tonight, she will discuss her approach as a filmmaker to some of society's most vex vexing concerns. Please join me in welcoming Agnieszka Holland. Thank you. I, I, I'm used to speak more through my movies than in some kind of the lectures, so you will forgive me if um, it will not have such a um, precise structure as my movie, I hope, have. Um, the subject of, um, of, um, of our meeting today is connected in some way to the movie you will see later on, or some of, of, um, of you have seen maybe before, uh, because it was, uh, uh, it was uh, in the distribution in the in, in, in United States uh, like six months ago. Uh, the movie is called In Darkness, and it speaks about um, the experience of the group of Jewish people from Lvov's ghetto, uh, who are doing the big action in the ghetto in 43, um, are escaping to the sewers of Lvov and spent many months there in hiding, uh, helped or on the beginning they don't feel that they are really helped, but being dependent on the Polish sewer worker, the guy who is not very good, who is not the exemplary character, who is ambiguous in his word of value and who 
um, decides to, to take care of them for the strictly monetary reasons. And after it becomes for him the question of the ambition, and after it becomes for him something like the question of the responsibility. I will be not talking about this movie in details because I hope those who haven't seen it will see it. Uh, I was hesitating quite a long time be before deciding to make this film. Um, the question of Holocaust was for me from my childhood something very important and it was because the country I, 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 I was born and raised in and because of my parents who've been from both sides connected to this experience. My father was a young Jew, he was 19 when the, when the war started. He was a young communist, uh, the students of the medicine, very radical, uh, very, uh, um, very <coughs> overspoken, and um, uh, he as a child even, he was probably eight or nine when he started to write for the Polish Jewish newspaper um, directed by Janusz Korczak, one of the most important Jewish intellectual and pedagogue and writer in before war Poland, um, who was for me one of the most important figure as a writer and as a man when I was when I was when I was um, growing, and um, who became the hero of the screenplay I wrote for Andrzej Wajda. Uh, who directed in, in uh, 90. So uh, my, uh, my father, my father, um, when the war started, escaped toward the east. Um, he'd been in Lvov, and after when uh, the German was approaching, he escaped to Soviet Union, was in the army, and came with the Polish Communist Army back to Poland. Um, my mother, a bit younger, was in the Polish underground in Armia Krajowa. Um, she, was, uh, she, she, she took part in the Warsaw Uprising in August 44. Uh, and she was formed by this experience of the, of the occupied Poland, occupied Warsaw. But what was for her probably the most important and most painful experience, it was uh, to be the witness to the Holocaust. It means as a, as a very young girl, she was watching ghetto dying. In this ghetto, the parents and the family of my father died. And when he came back to Warsaw with the, with the army, with the Polish army, uh, it was known left from his family. After he, he was lucky enough to find one of his sisters uh, who pretended to be, to, be, to be Polish and was in the forced labor in Germany and was saved by one Polish worker who pretended that she is his fiance. Uh, my mother had one very lucky day. Uh, it was just before the uprising, I think, a few months before, and she was um, out of Warsaw with her girlfriend, and they met the couple, young couple, young Jewish couple who escaped from the ghetto and um, who'd been in hiding, and this hiding um, uh, didn't work anymore, so they escaped from the, from the house when they'd been, uh, and they just met my mother and those two girls helped them to find another place, uh, organize the fake documents for them and save their lives. The woman was pregnant, so very quickly after the little boy was born. Um, and all the family of my mother, even if they've been not extremely courageous, philosemitic people, in some way participated in, 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 in helping this, this young people. And, um, uh, I think that it was the moment when my mother realized that exactly who saves one human's life and what she tried afterwards, all her grown-up life and uh, all the time when I, was, when I was growing, it was to remind what is important and um, 
to remind that something which she was witnessing as a child, as a young girl, cannot happen again. So when I was six, uh, I was, uh, I was, um, I was um, playing with my, with my um, um, uh, friends and the courtyard of the house, and suddenly one of the of this young um, young um, boy um, throw the stone against me and said that I am dirty Jew. I didn't understand exactly what it means. It was strange. It was very unpleasant. I came back to the home and I asked my mother if it's true, what it means, what it means to be a Jew. And she said to me that yes, that my father is a Jew, that all his family was um, killed by Germans, that to be a Jew is something which is very noble, that I have to be proud of that. And if somebody asks me if I am a Jew, I have to say, yes, I am. I didn't know then that um, I found myself in the most uh, um, uncomfortable position because uh, for the uh, Jews, I wasn't Jew, my mother wasn't, but for the Polish anti-Semites, I was Jewish enough. Um, so uh, I understood pretty quickly that um, I cannot take any real advantage of my situation, but I can to translate the situation to some kind of the curiosity um, about the identity. I, don't, I cannot tell that when I was six, I was making the deep search about the identity, but it was the subject which started to be present in my thinking and in my writing, because I started to write short stories quite soon. Um, and in some way, it was for me the kind of the provocation to tell to the people openly that I am Jewish. Um, I don't know if you know that in Polish society in this time, the word Jew was something which was scary. The non-Jewish people, even philosemitic non-Jewish people, thought that speaking about Judaity or Jews um, is in some way politically incorrect. And um, for the Jews, the few Jews who remained in Poland, most of them wanted to forget this identity, wanted to deny this identity. Um, the real Jews, the religious Jews, they reminded in the smaller cities um, or in, the, in, in Silesia, in Łódź, but uh, in Warsaw, when growing, I met maybe one or two persons of this kind. I thought that, frankly, that everybody is dead. I thought that the Jews, as you can meet in Jerusalem or in uh, Brooklyn, or today in Warsaw as well, uh, that they are the people from another planet, that they are the people from another time. So it was quite long, long work for me to understand that um, the Jewish identity is not only the martyrhood, it's not only the Holocaust, but it's also the history, the culture, the religious identity, and a lot of things which was totally exotic to everybody of my generation who grown in post-war Poland. So when I, when I started to think about what the Holocaust means to me, I understood that I'm looking at that not from the purely Jewish perspective, but from the perspective of somebody who is a second generation person who um, understood that probably this was the crucial point in the history of the humanity. That that was the crucial point which opened so many questions which most of people was unable to answer and even ask again. And um, that the literature, the things I read by Borowski, after by Primo Levi, by, by Paul Salan, um, are in some way actualizing those questions, but we are unable to have the real answers. 
And the fear of those questions and the fear of those answers and the fear that something that this virus, which shown the, its face during the, during the war, uh, can come back, uh, changed the Europe, made the Europe in some way ready to take some revolutionary political decisions, and uh, the fruit of this political decision, it was the beginning of the European Union. But we've been on the another side of the, of the, of the, of the Iron Curtain, and uh, for us, the war never ended. I was growing in the Warsaw, in Warsaw, which was full of ruins, but the ruins have been much deeper in the head of the people, in the, in the mind of the people. Uh, I remember any time when during the night the plane was um, um, flying over, 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 uh, over the sky, uh, I was afraid that it's another war. It was this mix of wish that the war will come again. The communists was something which Polish people didn't accept. And in the same time, terrible fear that it will destroy us forever. It, this, this experience of the Second World War, which was so palpable in Europe, uh, made generation of the filmmakers who changed the history of the cinema. Those filmmakers was 40 when I started to think about making movies. They've been young people. Andrzej Vajda, Ingmar Bergman, Antonioni, Fellini, Pasolini, um, Robert Bresson, many others who create Buñuel. They've been in late 30s, late 40s, the oldest. Uh, and um, I think that they felt that their life experience, the, life, the experience of, of, of the First and Second War, the experience of the Holocaust, the experience of the communism, um, made them as wise, as rich, as, as strong, that they've been able to t talk about the most essential and the most difficult questions of the society. I was thinking after if it's possible to make interesting movies if you don't have the life experience. It wasn't only that they knew what it means um, to live through the experience like, like the Holocaust experience. It, it was also that they felt some kind of the power. They felt that being a filmmaker, being a director, uh, gives you incredible strength, the tool to show the complexity of the, of the human's destiny. And because the people had the common experience with them, the audience followed. When I was um, going to the cinema to, to see an uh, Ingmar Bergman film, or to see Andrzej Vajda film, or to see uh, Andrzej Tarkovsky film, the theater was full. The people have been going to watch the movies which was asking and answering the questions which were substantial, existential, political, historical questions and which in some way spoke to the humans, to the human deeper life experience. Um, in communist Poland after 56, the repertoire of the cinemas have been made from the movies like that. The trash practically didn't exist. They didn't buy the things which been the most commercial or most cheap in terms of the, of, the, of, the, of the intellectual content. The movies we've been watching, and the millions of the people have been watching these movies, was the movies which today can find maybe 20,000 people in the country like that. Uh, so what I realized <clears throat> when I decided that I want to do something creative with my life, um, I realized that the movie, is the best tool and the best um, uh, medium 
to express myself, to express everything which I'm curious about, which I, I'm sensitive about, uh, that the film is exactly the medium which in the most modern way, in the most artistic way, uh, can communicate with the, with the people the most complicated and complex questions. And of course, I was mistaken in some way. Uh, but in this very moment, it looked that it's true. It was middle 60s, as I said, the generation of the great filmmakers been young and very creative. Um, the reality was changing. Um, the world was approaching the revolution of 60s, which had different, 68, which had different, different phase in different countries, but which gave some kind of the new energy and gave us the, the feeling uh, that we will be able to change the world again. Um, the paradox of the, of, the, of the communist country then was that even if the censorship was strong and even if the political oppression was always present and even if the freedom was very partial, um, even that we felt in some way much stronger than today in the free country and I can, any filmmaker can feel. Um, probably it came from those famous uh, sentences of Lenin um, who said that the cinema is the most important among arts. Um, it had paradoxical effect because on one hand the authorities in Soviet Union first and then in <coughs> another communist countries uh, started to control the cinema uh, and to um, be very afraid of the possible um, outbursts of the, of, the, of, the, of the freedom which can come through the uncensored cinema and it's difficult to censor cinema because cinema are images. It means you can censor words very easily, but it's much more difficult to censor something which doesn't have this precise um, content. Uh, so it was always a lot of tension around of the movies, uh, but also the filmmakers, because of that maybe, felt incredibly important. They felt that what they do can really change everything. They felt that they can say the things which um, uh, are impossible to be said in any other means, and that the audience is ready to read this kind of the cryptic words uh, translated to some kind of the cinematic artifacts, uh, because, um, uh, because they know uh, that they can communicate something much more much more courageous and much more um, um, uh, unspoken uh, than in any kind, uh, any kind of the political, uh, journalistic, or even literary communication. Uh, I remember when Andrzej Wajda did um, uh, the um, uh, Demon and Ashes, uh, it was three reunions of Central Committee of the Communist Party, which had been discussing this one single film. Imagine today that entire government, president of United States, and whoever discussed the film of, by, by, by Steven Spielberg in this way. Um, of course, it was scary on one hand, but on another hand, it gave um, uh, to, the, to the community of the filmmakers the purpose of importance. Um, it changed pretty quickly to some kind of the megalomania, co narcissistic feelings of the filmmakers. A lot of filmmakers started to think that they have to write to be the center of the universe. It, um, it shown it, its limitations during the transition in 89, when suddenly entire community of filmmakers as well in Poland, like in Hungary, or in other countries, suddenly, during few months, practically lost their position. They lost their position of the national artists, and they became just the players on the market economy. Um, it was also the fact that this generation who've been put together by the common experience of the atrocities of the Second War was uh, exchanged by the generation um, who thought that in some way the history is ending, especially after 89. You remember that it was 
a lot of talks coming from different intellectuals who've been talking that in some way the time of the history is over and that what we have now to do is to organize the life in the way which will be the most comfortable and the most um, egalistic and the most uh, just, but um, always on the very liberal, neoliberal terms. This kind of the feeling became so common that the people lost any interest in the most complicated questions uh, expressed by the cinema. The cinema became dull. The cinema became again, like before the Second War, like in the 20s, um, some kind of the pure, not very high quality entertainment and um, something which was just made to spend in pleasant way two hours of your time. Uh, not everybody, of course, accepted this kind of the, of the, of the, um, of the, of the aim of the cinema, and um, several directors, film critics, some producers decided to um, uh, fight for the importance of the intellectual content. They didn't have any more of the common kind of the experience with the society. The society was growing in one direction, and the um, um, ambitious filmmakers have been growing in another direction. What was linking them together, it wasn't this kind of the important experience which rooted, which rooted in, in, in some kind of the common, common tragedy or common knowledge of the, of the, of the possible dangers. Uh, but it was, um, it was just, It was just like translation of this experience to some kind of the fairy tale. What, what became the main content of the cinema? It was the fairy tale. In this fairy tale, of course, sometimes you can find the very important symbolic truth about our lives, very important, um, uh, very important existential code. But uh, everything is translated in the way that it, that it becomes so accessible and so easy to uh, digest that um, it doesn't, doesn't give you any kind of the, of the, um, of the un enrichment. Uh, the people started to dislike any kind of the content which forced them to make any kind of the effort. It means it mean that the cinema became effortless, easy, easy to digest, easy to spend time with, um, attractive in the terms of the efficiency, um, and um, never, asking the, never asking the things which you already, which you, which we, which you already don't, didn't know. Uh, I remember when I came to France in the 80s, um, I found still very curious and very, um, um, very ambitious audience. After I traveled to the United States and um, going to the American cinemas, I found that the audience is totally different, that the people are very, joyful and very open, but they don't want to see anything they haven't seen before. And I realized that the American audience is a bit like the ch children, because the children like to listen to the same story over and over again. And um, all those remakes, all those sequels, in some way was telling over and over again the same story you already knew. And um, French audience or Polish audience, I found the grown-up that they wanted to see every time the, something new. They wanted to meet something they haven't seen before. They wanted to be teached, provoked, uh, challenged. They refused to watch the sequels because the sequels was something exactly 
which they found uh, in infantile and uh, boring. Uh, that it was at the beginning of 80s, but by the middle of 90s, practically we haven't seen no difference between those two audiences. The European audience became exactly like American audience, and American audience grown even deeper into this kind of the direction. Um, and by the end of 90s, I had the impression that practically the time of challenge for the cinema and the time of vexing questions, the time of the provocation, the time of the real human experiences is over and that the um, only thing which counts uh, is um, the craft of the entertainment. Uh, and of course, American movies have been crafted in a pretty efficient way. Um, more efficient they've been, uh, less American they remained. The um, American cinema became in some way global cinema and lost very specific American content, American cultural content. That was another thing which I realized moving to States and meeting different producers and different executives, that the American cinema became the victim of its box office success on an international level. Um, when um, the producers and distributors, when the studio, major studio realized that they are making as much of money and relatively, and uh, then more money from international market than from American market, uh, they realized that um, they have to cease make the movies which are typically American, American genres like Western or film noir, or American content like the political or social movies speaking about, about the life in the United States. Uh, they developed the genre which are purely universal, universally understandable as well in Bulgaria, like in Taiwan, like in Australia, like in uh, China. Mm. And uh, this kind of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the movies are, again, fairy tales and romantic comedies. Those two genres appeared to be the most understandable and uh, the easiest to sell. Um, so, in the beginning of 21st century, I realized that I choose the profession, that I choose the art, uh, thinking that I will be able to express and to communicate the most complex and complicated questions about the humanity and, and, and my vision of the world. And by the end, I was only fighting with the box office and trying to survive, making the movies which can find some kind of the niche. The niche became the place for the ambitious cinema. Um, the filmmakers who've been um, using more complicated tools and uh, making more provocative films uh, reminded in the niches of the festivals and the art houses. And those art houses have been shrinking more and more. And um, in the beginning of 21st century, uh, Practically, the communication between popular cinema and um, ambitious cinema was broken. Happened something like with the music. When the pop music became something which was very commercial and popular um, and was speaking to the um, wider audience and um, uh, the serious music, the modern music, modern classical music, uh, became accessible only to very limited amount of people. And um, in some way, those two wars have been like the different genres completely. They didn't, <coughs> they didn't have too much in common, even if one and another was a producing musical kind of sounds. Um, it was, for me, the realization that in some way, I have to think that I made the wrong choice and that I had to 
do something different with my life, something that really will, will, will have some impact on the people and on myself, and something which will allow me to express the things which I think are important. Um, and only a few years ago, I started to think that this period that this period of um, escapism, that this period of the uh, fragmentarization, atomization of the society, uh, created this kind of the, of, the, of the confusion and fear, uh, which exactly made the people incapable uh, to receive the messages which are not the simple messages, but that this, that this period it's close to be over, that in some way the filmmaker can try again to speak to some kind of the common experience, which is the experience capable of, 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 of understanding the real danger of the modernity. And it is much more difficult to find what is our next problem, what is our real problem of, 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 of today, because it's, 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 not, it's not based on one kind of the archetypical experience as, for example, Second World War was. It needs from the filmmakers something much more sensitive, courageous, and innovative. It will be not enough to speak ob about the history. We have to speak about the future. We have to anticipate the future. We have to feel the temperature of the changes, which are, I think, inevitable, because the crisis which we are witnessing now in the United States, in Western Europe, in Asia, are not only economical questions, they are deep existential questions, they are deep social questions, and they are deep civilization questions. We are living in the time when everything is changing, and maybe cinema again can be the art which can express this change. By now, we can see only little, little small changes in the perception of the cinema among the younger audience. The internet makes the traditional kind of the distribution in some way anachronic. The internet opens the viewer to the more active and more creative approach. The danger of the internet on another side is that we are closing in, <clears throat> in some kind of the niches again, that the people are fighting and other people who are thinking in the same way, who are interested by the same kind of the subjects, who, are, who have the similar kind of the life experience, who have similar kind of the color, education, race, um, wealth, class, um, and um, certainly internet is not the medium which can create some kind of the common platform uh, for the society, for the nation, um, and for, for the humanity. So what it could be? What can be this common platform in the globalized world, which in the same time wants more and more to close in some kind of the, of the rec <coughs> recursive identity? What can be this platform which will open us to the experience with the, with, with, which will be certainly the common experience? I'm not sure if it can come, if, it, if we will be able to create it before some kind of the new catastrophe. If it's not that, the, that in some way the Second World War didn't end, and that we are living in the aftermath of that, and that we need another kind of the spasmatic, spasmatic explosion before to find the new wave of the unity. 
In post-communist Europe, it is very visible. I've been in Hungary right now, a few, few weeks ago, and um, I realized that the society is living not in the aftermath of the Second World War. They are living in the aftermath of the First World War. In some way, in Europe, you can feel that the First World War didn't end. And certainly, Second World War is probably in its middle. It just, it's just going on. It's one of the reasons I, why I decided to come back to the time of the Holocaust. I wanted to find the kind of the emotional thermometer, put it into the story, and feel how hot it can be for contemporary audience. How much of the actualization on the very emotional level, on the level of the pure phenomenological experience of this film, can speak to the contemporary audience. The reaction, emotional reaction of the audiences over the world to this film was very strong. But what was for me the most revealing, it was the uh, reaction of Polish audience. When I was doing this film, I refused to do it as a Hollywood-like, English-speaking Holocaust movie. I thought that only way to experience this reality again, it will be to find the most authentic tools uh, to express what this reality was. Uh, one of those tools have been the language or the languages of the story. The story is set in Lvov and I realized that the people have been speaking many languages. The Jews have been speaking Yiddish and German and Polish. The Poles have been speaking Polish, Ukrainian and some kind of the slang called Bawak. The Ukrainians have been speaking Russian and Ukrainians and Polish and so on and so on. So um, all my actors started to learn the different languages um, and uh, that was their way in some way into the characters. Uh, also another things, uh, um, another like authentic elements of this story I wanted to preserve and express. The darkness was one of that, but um, what I really wanted, it was to show the journey of the Polish character, which in some way symbolized the journey of the relationship of regular, ordinary Poles toward their Jewish neighbors. Uh, those who know a bit about, about contemporary Poland and about, um, also about Polish-Jewish relationship before the Second World War, during the Second World War, after, know that um, it's some kind of the cliché stereotype that Poles are deeply anti-Semitic. It is a stereotype, but it is also the truth. As many stereotypes, they are rooted in some kind of the truth. Uh, if you start to analyze why and what was the way of this antisemitism, what, what been the reason of this antisemitism, you of course complicate the thing and you see that all, all that is not as simple as you, as, you, as you wish. But for the quite long time, it was in Poland itself some kind of the unspoken subject. Um, the Poles have seen themselves and being oppressed for so many centuries, they found some kind of the, of the, of the, of the, uh, of the happiness in feeling uh, them, uh, 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 in watching themselves as a kind of the innocent heroic victims, the martyrs. This image has been so strong and um, it was so reconforting uh, that it was practically impossible to abandon it or to change it to some kind of the more dynamic, more modern, contemporary, and intellectually more challenging image. Um, and um, the fact that the Poland was frozen by the communist <clears throat> regime uh, made this kind of the self-preservation of this kind of the of this image um, quite easy. It was 
frozen in some kind of the, of the uh, anachronistic, anachronistic feeling of rightness. Uh, and um, probably 10 years ago, around 10 years ago, um, the book was published, written by um, a Polish Jewish sociologist, um, anthropologist, and historian Jan Tomasz Gross, which described the story of one village in Poland called Jedwabne. In this village, um, after when the Soviet occupation of Poland, which started in 39 and ended in part, part of Poland was divided, it means Poland was divided between Stalinian Soviet Union and, and um, uh, Hitler's Germany. And this part, which was under, um, under the occupation of Soviets, um, was um, liberated by Germans uh, in 41. Uh, and um, in this part of the Poland was a lot of resentment against some Jews who've been collaborating with Soviets. Uh, why the Jews have been collaborating with Soviets, why, why they welcomed the Soviets in, with such an enthusiasm quite often, that is another story which I will be now not describing. Anyway, uh, if you even start to dismal the Polish-Jewish relationship, you see that after every fact comes another fact and another fact and another explication and that it is practically impossible uh, in one evening to explain the 10th percent of, this complica of those complications. Um, anyway, in this, um, in this village, the Pol Polish, um, Polish um, um, citizens um, burn to death in the barn all his Jewish neighbors. Some of them who escaped have been killed with the naked hands by his neighbors exactly, and practically only few Jews survived this massacre. When this book had been published, it was an enormous shock. The first reaction was a denial. Second reaction, it was the diminution of importance of this act. It was the isolate act. It was something which was not typical. It was something which was ordered by Germans. It was something which um, concerned on the small amount of the population. But then the Polish historians who been working on the Polish-Jewish relationship during the Second World War started to dig deeper and deeper into the archives and they found another villages and other facts and other acts of this kind. And they started to analyze based on the new documents or the documents which been accessible after the opening of the different archives that the relationship of Poles toward the Jewish co-citizens have been not as simple and not as positive as some kind of the official propaganda said. And that the examples of the murders have been not isolated, but in, especially in some regions and especially in the countryside, was some kind of the normal behavior. So the shock was very, very deep because it in some way put the dark spot of the own vision of Poles about themselves and um, asked the questions which were too painful and too complicated to answer without going really deep into some kind of the self-analysis of the national consciousness. Of course, it's the new generation, it's the people who've been born mostly after the Second War, and uh, who are second, third, fourth generation, 
who cannot be held responsible for what their grandparents did. But in the same time, they wanted to feel responsible, or at least they wanted to know. And this, um, this search for the truth, conducted not only by the historians and not only by the intellectuals, but also for the big amount of young people and also by the leading politicians from both sides, because this exam of the conscious was made as well by post-communist president Kwasniewski and for the right wing president Kaczynski. When I was witnessing this kind of the, of the, of the very painful <clears throat> process of self-discovery, um, I started to be really proud that I am the part of, 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 of this nation, especially that before I spent about 15 years in France, where this same kind of the self-examination have been much more, how to tell, faked or much more re relative or less intellectually courageous. Of course, it wasn't that entire Poland started suddenly to put the ashes on their head. But this um, movement was not only the movement of the elites. I think that in some way it touched something much deeper and wider. So it also changed the relation the Poles had to those among, among them who've been during the Second War heroically helping Jews. Somebody like my mother or somebody even more heroic who risked the life of entire family to save somebody who, is, who was the stranger. After the war, those people have been not recognized as the national heroes. That been, they've been not only recognized as the national heroes, but they've been also in some way treated as some kind of the traitors. Especially in the smaller communities, in the smaller cities or smaller on, in the countryside, in the villages, they've been in hiding. Quite often it was difficult to know who they are. Um, when in 68, 67, 68, um, Władysław Bartoszewski, um, uh, together with um, uh, Miss Levin, wrote the book of the, um, of the <coughs> um, memoirs um, and um, uh, recollection uh, about those who've been helping the Jews during the war and who've been um, writers among the nation, uh, they had real problems to have the permission um, from many of them to get their names to be published. Even in American books of this kind, the names of the writers among the nation, Polish writers among the nation, was mostly changed. The people have been afraid that it will be that the fact that their neighbors will know that they've been helping Jews during the war can create for them some problems. And for some of them, it did create the problems, like for Miss Wyszykowska in Jedwabne, for example. So, <laughs> even the people like Irena Sendlerova, who was living in Warsaw, been unknown by the community, by the society, and their heroic acts haven't been recognized. 
Uh, Irena Sandlerova is a perfect example. She lived long enough to see um, the change because she, she died a few years ago in the 90s. Uh, but she was the woman who during the, um, during the Second War um, working as a um, Red Cross worker, saved a few thousand of Jewish children uh, from the Warsaw Ghetto. And um, she did something more heroic and bigger in scale than Oskar Schindler did. Still, no one in Poland knew about her except the children, then children and after grown-up people who've been saved by her. Uh, and um, the article about her appeared in, um, in the um, American newspaper and two uh, school girls from North Car Carolina read about it. They've been very impressed and they wrote the school play about this woman. And it became the little um, event, this, this play. And actually somebody told to them that this woman is still alive and that she lives in Warsaw and it was organized by some, I, I don't know exactly who. Anyway, they came to Warsaw and they met um, their heroine. And this fact put the light on Irena Sendlerova. If, if, if it wasn't those two schoolgirls, I'm not sure if um, her name will be known before her death. Um, so when Marek Edelman um, died a few years ago, somebody at his funeral said that Marek Edelman, who is one of the most heroic figures um, among Polish Jews and was the last commandant um, of um, the um, Warsaw Ghetto insurrection, and after the war, the famous cardiologist and um, the member of the Polish opposition uh, against the, the communist regime, that he wasn't really considered as a Polish hero. And I think that now it's changed. When um, I finished the movie In Darkness, hoping that this kind of the, of the, of the, of the hero I'm showing allow the people to understand all this complex journey, one, have to go through when he wants to understand the other. Um, we've been showing the film to, uh, to Polish distributors with the producers, and the emotional reaction of the distributors have been very strong. One of them had some kind of the, of the, of the hysterical fit. He was, he was sobbing so strongly that we had to let him go out from the, from the, from the room. When he calmed down, he said that it's probably the most moving movie he ever seen, but that he will not buy it because he doesn't see what kind of audience can come to the movie theater to watch it. It was like a year and a half ago. So finally, after a few weeks, we found one distributor who had enough of faith into the film that he said that he can try to make some kind of the promotion and to, to sell it for a Polish audience, using also <clears throat> as a promotion tool the fact that the movie had been submitted by Poland as a Polish entry to the Oscars, which always can help to wake up some kind of the curiosity. But still, we've been all thinking that to let the people to come to the theater to watch during two hours 25, because the movie is long, in the darkness, the group of Jewish people struggling with rats and their own weakness and the all possible dangers, it will be very difficult. So I've been secretly hoping that the film can make about 200,000 viewers, which is in Poland today pretty honorable result. And when we opened the movie, the first weekend was more than that. What was the most interesting, it was that the audience had been made mostly by young people. 
and the film have been played in the multiplexes. Several young people came two or three times to watch this film. How it was possible is still for me difficult to, to, to understand. Because I imagine these young people, the girl and, um, and boy, they are going to the movie theater in the mall. They see several you know, films, they have the choice. They, they see Sherlock Holmes, uh, they see the uh, cat in the booth, they see some kind of the romantic comedy and they see the juice in the sewer. <laughs> and they take the money from the pocket, it's a lot of money, the movie tickets are quite expensive, and they go to see the juice in the sewer. They are buying the, 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 the <clears throat> bag of popcorns, because that is the part of the going to the movie, even in Europe and even in Poland. And after two hours, 25, them caught, come out from the movie theater with those popcorns untouched. So, in some way, I found the way into, straight into the heart of, the, of this audience. If it was because they wanted to see the good Paul, yeah, maybe, you know. The only successful movies about the Holocaust in Germany, it was the movies where, which shown the good German. It was Schindler's List and The Pianist. But in the same time, you know, this poll is not as good as they used in Poland to have. It wasn't romantic hero, the right romantic hero who is fighting for the justice and truth and risking his life. He doesn't want to risk his life. He doesn't, he's anti-Semitic, he's selfish, he's greedy, and he's incredibly ordinary. And this ordinariness suddenly become, uh, became attractive. Suddenly the people wanted exactly to, not to have the judgment, not to have the knowledge, the a priori knowledge what is right and what is wrong. Th they wanted to, to, to make this journey, they wanted to have the experience. Never before I had so many letters and so many reactions from the people also on the internet. Of course, some of them have been very aggressive, but even those who've been coming from politically or ideologically, um, very different side that my personality is, they've been in some way touched by the film. They've been in some way taken to this story. They, they was, they, they've been unable to reject it. Even if they didn't want to like it, they had some kind of the connection. And this kind of the connection, you know, was something which, 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 is, which was probably my biggest victory. So I started to think that maybe it's not altogether so bad with the, with the, with the moviegoers that the audience is changing, and this change after was confirmed by the popularity of another movies made by my younger direct, uh, colleagues, who've been mostly contemporary this time, but not only, and who've been speaking about painful and dark sides of the social life in Poland and about the struggles of the young people who are unable to accept the reality. And suddenly those films, we've been not at, at all the entertainment, but been the things which try to show what is the real angst of the young generation became the most popular Polish movies of the year. So probably the feeling that we cannot avoid the problems, that we cannot escape the problem, that the problems are not coming and slapping us into the face will make the serious cinema interesting again to the audience.
As about the ratios among the nation, their situation, as I said, in Poland changed. Maybe because we had to accept that we did terrible things and was not only the innocent and heroic victims, made us want to have also another model figures to embrace those among us who've been doing the opposite. The real change I realized, like probably a year ago, year and a half ago, in the similar time when, 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 when I finished my film and was showing it to the distributors, and it was when I was reading the um, uh, announcement, that announcement, the Klepsiders, how do you call it? The um, mortuary, mortuary. The what? Obituary, obituary, yes. Obituary in the, in the, in the Polish newspapers and um, um, obituary are important, uh, important thing in, in Polish culture. Uh, it's the only country probably where uh, a lot of obituary is directed uh, directly to the dead people. Uh, it's not only the information about, you know, about, um, about the, the um, deceased, but it's also some kind of the communication with, with the deceased. For example, you can write, Dear Bill, I miss you so much. And of course, the, view, uh, the reader who is reading that doesn't know who is the Bill and who is writing it, but still um, the important part of the obituaries has this kind of the poetics. But mostly, of course, in traditional way, they they say what the beloved father or brother or mother did important uh, in, um, in, in, in his or her life and how deeply he will be uh, missed. And about a year and a half ago, the notion, among other things, started to appear in those obituaries and was told that this and this have been writers among the nation. So in some way, it entered the pantheon of Polish heroes. If it will make Poland less accessible to the possible virus of the racism, anti-Semitism, neo-Nazism, I don't know. I think that this virus right now is running in the, in the, in the, in the veins of Europe. We've seen Breivik. It looked like something extraordinary, but it is not as extraordinary. We see it among the funda fundamentalist Islamic terrorists. We see it in different places of the world, and it's growing. Certainly, the cinema will not stop it. But at least we can try to remind that this virus is something which we know about. To finish, <clears throat> and to finish my Holocaust movie experience with the note which is not so optimistic or pessimistic, um, when I was showing this film, um, in states, in France, um, in different places, quite often I have I had the question coming from the film critics, from the journalists, why another movie about Holocaust? It made me angry, of course, because I never heard the question, why another romantic comedy? So, I think that this kind of the question one is able to answer only by another film, which is not romantic comedy. Finished. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you very much. And we will take now a few questions. All I want to do is to tell you that I am a Holocaust survivor from Poland uh, as a teenager. Partially, I survived in a monastery. It's a long story. I did write a book and was told why another book about the Holocaust, just like you experienced. So I am grateful that you have made a movie, and I like to share with you my book that is entitled Passport to Life, because my false papers, Hauschiebe Papiere, was my passport to life. Thank you. A question about which I have been thinking for some time already. You spoke about this complicated issue of Poles and Jews, and I've been thinking about this complicated issue of uh, Jews and communists uh, in, in the World War II context. Um, you said that, well, on the, on the one hand, you uh, well spoke about this post uh, war, World War II anti Semitism, uh, relating it to the communist regime in some way. On the other hand, you mentioned that your um, father went to the Soviet Union and that's how he was saved. And I know lots of people who actually came from Poland, lots of Jews came from Poland to the Soviet Union and then joined the resistance and the Polish army and the partisan brigades and that somehow, or did not join anything but still survived. So can you somehow, well, and they believe that they survived because of this communist ideology of internationalism. So can you say something about this, well, a tribal relationship of Poles and Jews and communists, well, in this context. I understand it's complicated, but... Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah, it is complicated because, you know, yes, among Jews, a lot of, especially Jewish youth, in between the wars became communists. Uh, they became communists because they... Mm, um, abandoned the traditional Jewish religious life, which secluded them to some kind of the poverty and isolation. They had the ambitions to take the important part in the society, and the society was mostly rejecting them. So the communism looked like the good choice it was the story of my father, for example, but it was the story of many. Um, it looked like the good choice to fight for the equality, the justice, the social justice, and also the um, um, rejection of the antisemitism. As you know, in Poland before the war, the antisemitism, as well like in another part of Europe, in Germany or Austria, um, grown up with a quiet, incredible speed. And um, it wasn't only the Jews who felt not to be the full value citizen in before war Poland, it was also Ukrainians and Belarusians. So the country wasn't really just to the minorities of any kind. Um, it explains, it's one of the explanations why um, uh, so many Jews choose the communism as their life perspective and ideology and uh, the faith. Um, as about um, who survived among Jews during the Second War in Poland, it was three kinds of Jews who had the chances to survive. Even the communists, or those who've been deported to Soviet Union, or those who fled to Soviet Union, like my father. Uh, they've been the Zionism, who before the war went to Palestine. And they've, me, they've been the uh, assimilated Jews, who spoke good Pol Polish, and who had the web of friends, of Polish friends, who've been able to help them, to provide them with the fake papers, and to find the shelter for them. 
But the most of Jews in Poland, the mass of Jews, the Jews of Shtetl, the Jews of Nalewki, they've been the Jews who didn't speak the good Polish, who didn't have the money, who didn't have the interest in, this, in going to Palestine, who hated communism, and who just wanted to have their religious, normal Jewish life. All of them practically perished. So um, it also explained why it was so easy to find the Jews after the war who wanted to collaborate with the new regime and who believed that they can cure Poland from the nationalism and anti-Semitism and fascism, as they say. And most of them were absolutely convinced that the cure they are taking part in made the Poland happier and more just country. Of course, it wasn't true. That is a very simple explanation of very complex and complicated question. Your last name. Uh, it doesn't sound Polish, it doesn't sound Jewish. Can you tell us a little bit about your last name? Um, my last name is Holland, and the French president last name is Holland as well. But uh, I don't know the origins of his. Uh, mine is the name of my father. I kept the name of my father. Uh, my father, who was a communist, as I said, um, uh, stopped to believe in the writers of the, of the, of the communists around 53, 54. And in 56, he was something which was called in communist Poland the revisionist. It means he still believed that the social justice is possible and necessary for the happiness of the people, but he didn't believe anymore that the Communist Party, based on the Soviet rules, can provide it. Uh, so, um, uh, in some point, um, he was arrested um, under the practically fake accusation, and uh, during the uh, investigation, he committed suicide. It was in 61, and it was pretty famous story which happened in, 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 in the Poland of this time. The, the, the name of my father was very well known. He had a lot of friends among the intelligentsia, among the scientists, among the uh, artists. Uh, he'd been then still the member of the Communist Party, but several people who took the part in his funeral as a kind of the demonstration after uh, had the problem in the party and some of them lost their positions. So. Uh, the name of my father, I was 13 then, uh, became some kind of the burden for me because it, 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 it made my life much more complicated. I became some kind of the, you know, of the parias in communist Poland, not only because I had the Jewish origins and the official antisemitism was growing till the explosion in 68, but also because I, I, I was the daughter of my father. Um, but it's exactly why I wanted to keep this name. And w w even when I married, I, 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 I didn't change my name. And I remember that in some point when I came back from uh, my study in Prague, in Czechoslovakia, because as, as Genevieve said, I was studying in Czechoslovakia, and I was there in 68 when the Soviet tanks came to, to, to uh, to dis destroy the, 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 the shy freedom of the, of the, of the Prague Spring. Um, and I was arrested after I spent some time in the prison. I was, I was sentenced and so on. So uh, I wanted absolutely to add to, the, to my father's name my own, my own um, burden. Uh, and uh, in this time, you know, I was curious about everything. So being in prison was very, very actually interesting experience for me. I, I, I never regretted it. It, it, it taught me a lot. Uh, but of course, it created the new problems for myself. And <clears throat> Czechoslovakia became very quickly impossible to live in. 
So I came back to Poland and tried to make the movie there. It was, it was, it was practically impossible because I was blacklisted. But a lot of my colleagues, the Andrzej Wajda in the first place, but also Krzysztof Zanussi and Krzysztof Kieślowski was fighting for me. They've been really doing a lot of efforts and pressure. Um, and if, if it wasn't because of them, I, I, I would never become the filmmaker, probably. Uh, so I, 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 I experienced this kind of the very strong solidarity coming from my colleagues, my Polish colleagues, and um, it crafted also my, my connection to the society altogether, I think. Um, anyway, uh, in this moment when I had the biggest trouble, uh, Andrzej Wajda um, offered me to, to, to adopt me. He wanted legally adopt me and give me his name, because he thought that like that I will be but, yeah, of course, I, I was very grateful, but I wanted to keep this, you know, this mm, heavy in, 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 in blood and problems name of my Jewish father. And uh, why Holland? Um, uh, after um, I, um, I found the information that uh, it was uh, n name given to Jews who escape Holland in 17th, 18th century after a religious war and um, settled in some part of Poland around of Ostrowenka mostly. And uh, they've been given the name like that, Holland, Hollander, Hollander. It's several Jewish, Polish people who, who had this name. I think we want to thank you immensely for sharing your thoughts and your experiences with us. <laughs>